Okay, so uh, to the main event. So we saw Naeem last week uh, and uh, um, Aaron helped us bring this together. So I'm going to pass it to Aaron to uh, introduce himself and uh, take it from there. Thanks, Aaron. Hi. Ah, oh, my pleasure. Uh, so hi, uh, my name is Aaron Williams. I'm the Dev Advocate Community Manager for LF Edge. Uh, that's the Linux Foundation's kind of edge projects. Under there, there are 10, now 10 uh, projects. Uh, one of them is uh, called Open Horizon, and uh, that there is a piece of Open Horizon that is on the Mayflower. And as part of that, um, they brought in Eric and Naeem um, to uh, speak with us. And I thought this was one of the most amazing uh, ships or just projects, IoT projects um, that I've ever seen. And uh, thus, when I had the opportunity, when we started up this kind of autonomous projects group, um, uh, you know, they were both of the, this was the presentation that was uh, first, my first idea. So uh, let me get to, very quickly introduce Eric and Naeem and then uh, get to the, the good part. So Eric is a, he's a worldwide IBM hardware product strategy team. Um, he focuses on how to have a sym uh, symmetrical, cohesive approach on the cloud. So he focuses on cloud technologies, artificial intelligence, and security. Uh, most recently, he's become a quantum ambassador, helping companies to assess how they can get ready to use um, quant uh, quantum computing. Uh, and then from his uh, strategic technology focus, he's working on this project, which is the Mayflower Autonomous Ship and its cognitive uh, capabilities. He also works with CERN um, with uh, collision sensors, event selections. So basically about 10 million collisions events per second and then how to do deep learning onto that. Um, absolutely, you know, just a great, <laughs> great set of titles. And Naeem, we met him last week. He is, uh, uh, works with uh, IBM's Blue Technology Innovation Group, focusing on innovating from the edge computing into space, um, or edge, the edge of space, however you'd like to phrase it, uh, to supply chain optimization for space assets, to autonomous cognitive framework for CubeSat sw swarms, and to the growing challenges of uh, space debris and collision avoidance, um, as you know, uh, Mr. Musk is throwing up more and more satellites that I actually can see from from a large city. It's kind of amazing how much stuff is up there. Um, and one of the projects that he has worked on and and helped do was also the Mayflower. So uh, why don't I stop talking and let uh, Eric and I take over? And once again, thank you guys so much for for coming and making the time for yourself or yes. the time for us and your busy yes. schedule. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Hans. I like this. Hans Solo. It's great. Name. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share something. So I'm calling in from Nice in France. So, hey, from the other side of the pond. But, uh, you know, that's the good thing about virtual meetings. We can do stuff we wouldn't do before. So let me, I'm going, we're going to use a, um, um, a presentation and we'll try to show you a, a a movie at the end let's see if it works see it does it work for everybody yes okay yes. good so You're good. Um, so the ship we're going to talk to you about is called the mayflower because it's yeah, it's to commemorate uh, the mayflower trip but uh, uh, i want to start by saying this is not a ship made by ibm okay this is a ship made by a company we we'll show you the people, and uh, we've helped them. Okay, so this is uh, IBM is not in the business of doing ships yet. You never know in the future. So, the you, if you look at the planet, you have to recognize like you know the planet is blue because it's covered by sea, and uh, uh, there is another interesting thing about the, the planet. It's like, uh, I don't know if you can read the charts, that may be very small in your screen, but essentially 90% of everything you buy comes from a boat. And despite this, there's very little data on the planets, uh, for, on, the, on our planet oceans versus what we have on Mars, the moon and satellites. So it's kind of interesting, you know, you have me on the ground and Naeem on the satellites, but uh, we don't have a lot of things 
a lot of knowledge about the sea. And so there is something to be done there. And actually, uh, uh, it goes beyond pollution, OK? And, uh, and, and that's where the, the Mayflower ID came. So before we go into the technology, I think you need to understand why they are doing this. You know, this is very important. So the people who are doing that ship are oceanographers, uh, submarine makers. Uh, they work with oil and gas, and they've been doing this for a long time. And they decided to do uh, something new to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower voyage. So this was in 2020, September 16. As you noticed, something happened in the middle, and we got a little bit of, um, you know, in electronics, we call that a delay line, and we are now in May. And the ship should go, I guess it's going to be next week if the weather gets better, but about to go, and we'll show you how to see what's happening on the ship live, okay, at the end. So, and the, the goal they wanted to do is beyond the commemoration was to do a ship that will allow low cost science on the ocean. And, and this is something that you have to, to visualize, and there is a very simple number to visualize it. The cost for a research ship is about 100 to 200 million dollars or euros, whatever. The cost of that ship is about 2 million. So this is going to change the scale of research because some countries that couldn't afford research can do research and some countries that have research ship can have a fleet of autonomous research ships. And, and you understand that there is nobody on board. So if you lose the ship, actually it's an insurance claim. You're not losing people, so you can actually do many. And to do this, uh, the challenge was uh, that they had everything in robotics from their earlier project. You know, they do submarines that do crazy stuff uh, that they sell to navies. Um, crazy stuff, I mean, like, you know, they can uh, dock between submarines while moving at sea. At, you know, this is a very complex thing. This is more complex than docking on space because you have currents and there is no currents on space, for example. So they, they decided to build the cognitive part on top of the robotics that they had to make it uh, a ship that could actually decide by itself where it goes based on the mission orders. And that's that's a big challenge, even if they had all the base for doing this. And that's the Mayflower. So you see, it's a, it's an history uh, looking forward goal point. It's a, it's a ship for research, for making research easier and better. And it's also a, a technology proof challenge and uh, that's what we're going to look at. So now, uh, what is the ship going to do? Uh, well, it's going to soon cross the ocean. So that's you have the, the route that's planned here. Uh, so again, uh, we tell the ship, you go to Boston, and it will decide on its route, OK? It's not going to be like waypoint base and uh, uh, you know drone-like uh, activity. And you have um, uh, an old but still accurate cut of the of the ship on the screen, and you see there is a big empty space in the middle. This is a huge bay for about uh, I don't know in pound, but 800 kilograms of scientific experiments. So this is a lot of stuff you can carry. And in the front, you see the yellow boxes. So one of those boxes is all the AI. So all the AI for that ship fits into a suitcase size box. That's kind of crazy and it, it has triple redundancy so those guys have done an excellent job and i want to show them those people to know that the two guys who did it so uh, they they have a company it's a u.s company it's called submergence uh, they have a subsidiary in the uk called them subs and they have another subsidiary called marine ai and they built the solution and they give the ship to a fund a foundation to operate it so they actually open a call for researchers and what's going to be in the ship will be coming from various universities. So you may know people who want to put something on the ship will connect you with Promare. And Promare will operate the ship for probably 10 years unless something bad happens. You know, it's the ocean, so things can happen. Any questions from the people on board? It's kind of, no, it's like yeah. those virtual meetings. Nobody's asking questions. I don't understand why you don't speak out. <laughs> yeah, uh, no questions right now. No question. Okay, so we are not. Wait, uh, I have actually. I have one. 
Is there yeah. a plan to make more of these? Yes. Yes, <laughs> that's it. That, the Mayflower already has a browser. Oh, awesome. And cool. there will be, uh, yeah, we, we'll explain you with Naeem why this is possible. Okay. Okay. So, um, so again, one interesting thing, we have not paid them to use anything, anything from IBM. Okay. So we don't fund them. They have compared our technology with all the competitive technology. And then they say, okay, we would like to use this technology. They are not using only IBM stuff in there. There are a bunch of partners providing stuff. Okay. Like Thales, Varsila, you know, Panda, Vodafone, etc. And um, everything we're going to show you, they use, they decided based on this value, we didn't pay them. Uh, we are very happy. It works very well. And, uh, and by the way, in those technology, one key one is for the connectivity and it's, it was only possible because I could find Naeem and we could make it work. And that's based on the Horizon uh, solution. So the, the one that's in the, the Linux Foundation. Uh, and um, Naeem, I'm going to move to the next chart. You know, I, I'd like you to explain the, you know, the connectivity and the hybrid aspect, uh, aspect of the solution inside the ship. So we're going to go under the hood in the ship now. OK, thank you. All right. so. Uh... <clears throat> Like Eric was explaining, and I'm not, sh you know, sure what Eric was saying about docking between the uh, ships easier than the uh, than the orbit while we're moving at 17,000 miles per hour. So Eric, you need to check on that, my friend. Okay, so uh, the over here the solution which I'm looking at, right? So like I explained, you know, when we last time we're talking about this ship we see is a very interesting use case for edge computing. Fully, like Eric mentioned, fully autonomous, right? With a lot of uh, systems on board and experiments and stuff. So uh, so we use the concept of the, the edge computing. We had a project which Eric mentioned, it's open source uh, for the LF edge the community over there. And basically there is an edge endpoint which is installed on the, uh, on the board itself. And then we have these systems on ground. So sort of a hybrid spectrum where we have, you know, on prem or on cloud and going all the way. Actually, in this case, we have all of these. We have stuff on prem. We will have stuff on on the cloud as well as stuff, you know, on the uh, on the board, which is should be in the ocean. So, like you mentioned, you know, there is a there are, there are rules engines running over there. There are decision making engines running over there. There's a lot of things from the AI autonomous aspect, and these things, and we are running using the Red Hat. Uh, stuff and Docker engine. So we are building the code on the on-prem and this code will be pushed. Initially when the board leaves, I, everything is preloaded. So because the connection can be very intermittent between, you know, as you are in the middle of the ocean or if there is a storm and stuff. So the board will be loaded with all of this uh, code, of course. And then we have the option, you know, if we want to uh, update or push any new code because the, uh, the vision about this board is it's like a living laboratory, right? It's a it's a floating in the ocean, and the ocean is like seventy percent of our planet. So you know, uh, and then when in the future, as we discussed last time, you know, we think about okay, if we have these uh, satellites or Starlink or CubeSat or whatever it is, and they detect some very interesting event happening somewhere, it can ask the board, you know, you are in a nearby area, can you go and take a look? And the board is loaded with sensors and i think uh, uh, eric will explain more about what kind of sensors we have on this board uh, <clears throat> so from the um, now the underlying components of this uh, how it, it works right so we have very similar to what we use on our terrestrial networks like we have a typical messaging bus which is uh, you know where you put the information and you can receive on the other end of this bus and then you can store this information you have a real-time stream and then you want to have a historical stream so you know typical stuff where you can use databases like a you know for example mongodb or something like that and then you have object storage where you can dump all this information for historical purposes and the data analysis and then we have apis uh, available which are built to go and extract information real time and i put the uh, website in the chat mass400.com where you will be able to see live information or near real time as the board sales uh, in a few weeks and uh, so there's api available and the purpose of the api was you know the research facilities or the universities or other, other you know institutions who want to access information they will have 
this API available, and I think that will be decided how there will be some stuff freely available or some maybe there is some monetization behind that. Then you have these uh, AI assistant, like today we see this virtual assistant because they are, you know, because so much information is coming uh, back to the to the systems, and you can have a virtual assistant where where we have a plan to actually we have this thing called what's the name of this octopus? Uh, is it Captain AI or what do we name that octopus, Eric? The name is Archie. Archie, yes, Archie. So we have an Archie. If you go on that website, you'll see this very beautiful uh, octopus there, Archie. And you know you can interact with it. You can ask questions. Uh, we have fed it with a lot of uh, historical information as well for the Mayflower stuff. So it's it's for schools and you know to have their projects. They can interact with that uh, information. And then uh, there, of course there's, there's there's a portal over there. The other aspect of this uh, from the satellite communication is AIS. So AIS is sort of like a GPS getting you all the information about uh, the ship, the lat long status, speed, pitch roll, all these different aspects of uh, of the uh, of the port. And I think if I can maybe let me see if I have the option to share a screen or uh, Eric, if you can just bring that mass400.com site up. Uh can do it. Okay. Give me a and this is the uh, the portal which we have built. Like so, for, like I was explaining, right? That the board is built by the team, and then most of the software side. This is where IBM teams we have came together to build the portal, the decision management engine, the rules engine, and then the, the platform we have. And I think I like this part to share. You see my screen? Yes, yes, you can. So if you click on the yeah, yeah, this is this is a real time dashboard, and you know it will have more information as and, and the location information, as the board sales, and, and this is the live. live no, well, I think it's a picture right now. This is a recording from today. Okay, awesome. Right. It's it's night today. Right now it's it's night time in the UK. Okay, but that's mm -hmm. a, so the, the yeah there is a the live view. You have a dashboard, and everything on the dashboard, actually, it's just a, a very simple Node-RED MQTT application. You can get it on your, your laptop. Yes. So there is a Kafka information, you know, the, the bus, which is between the board and when it comes to the show, but then we have MQTT as well, which is a very, as you know, lightweight protocol for getting information. So there are different mechanisms in place to retrieve the information. That's the RC you can see on the bottom right. Yeah. Uh, yep. It's pretty cool stuff. And in the technology section, there's a very uh, good information about the board and the sensors and everything is there. But again, the idea was the board is a living thing, right? Like a lab with a bunch of sensors and uh, you know researchers and whoever wants to, to work with this, they can push their workloads through containers and we have the computer over there and you can run the experiments and get information. So, and like Eric said, this is just the beginning. And, uh, and imagine the future with the, uh, these uh, container ships, right, where majority of this stuff is coming. But you know, think about those all being autonomous in the future. So that's where we are. Uh, it's not going to be like tomorrow, OK? And I can speak for not. Week, but <laughs> yes. you know, maybe one day. Now, the yes, interesting okay. thing is that um, uh, the, this is uh, a very nice hybrid solution. You know, people talk about what is a hybrid cloud, hybrid solution. Yeah, you have one. You have an on-prem, you have in the cloud, and you have on the edge, and there can be many ships in that solution. That's that's the great stuff about this design. It allows for a set of ships or a set of something. And one interesting thing about the design that you see is that we are already talking with clients that saw it, and they are talking to us about their industrial setup. They're not talking about the ship. They are looking at this saying, okay, so the cloud is... Uh, is, is the cloud and the control center is my headquarters. And then, you know, every edge is my production facility or subset of my production facility. So it's a, it's a very interesting and replicable to other places. Uh, so I don't see anything on the live chat. Uh, you, you have to check. Maybe I click on the wrong stuff. But if you have no, questions. No, so I see it. So the first question is. Uh, do you anticipate that the AI capabilities on the Mayflower will work its way into large commercial ships? Yeah, it's actually being done. So it's not I anticipate. It's some people came to see the ship being tested, and uh, 
the result is, uh, uh, you know, I don't know a continent where we are not discussing or if it's not happening. And they will not speak about it. Okay. And I'm not talking about military or strange use. I'm talking commercial. Okay. And, and, uh, and uh, go ahead, please. Yeah. So it, it's, it's interesting because it's happening. Uh, mm -hmm. There is already a submarine that used that technology in the UK. It's called the Excel. Excel UV, you can check up on the BBC. It's there was a report, Excel UV uh, uh, demo, and uh, some people called us, and you know we connected them with the ship maker. I says because they want their own. And uh, the interesting thing is, again back to my initial thing about you know think about the cost difference. Um, you know you can do research for very cheap. <laughs> I mean we're talking millions but you know those people are used to talk hundreds of millions so for them it's like 100 times cheaper that makes a big difference okay so, I think so also the question was one of the is the ESTA ship fully solar powered or is there another power source so there is a, a panda system in it which is a, an hybrid system so the ship uh, runs on electric motors two electric motors on the single you know um, propeller uh, which are on a battery system, which is recharged by uh, solar panels, but to allow the ship to be at sea for long duration, operate at night, those kind of things. For and, and in all latitudes, there the, there is a, a biofuel generator in it. So the ship has a very long range. So the range of the current setup, which can be changed, is about one to two months, depending what latitude. And if you are at the equator with a lot of sun, it can be. I mean, the problem is not the ship range. The problem becomes the experiments on board that are actually collecting samples, because you actually have to go get the samples. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, let's uh, talk about the the AI on board because I think it's a it's something we were discussing before the um, the beginning of the call, and it's a trend. This is the typical example that shows you that we went from a world with. Uh, simple IoT and we are getting into edges that have a lot of sensors and that do a lot of things. So if you look at what the ship has to do, and I, I have to, you know, maybe uh, precise this again, the ship is not always connected. So it's taking all the decisions autonomously on board. So that's why you have dotted line here. Connection is not permanent. And so the ship carries scientific experiments. I don't know if you see my pointer, maybe, maybe not. And uh, on the left, and so I'm going to go open the box that's called the AI Captain. Explain you how it's working. So the problem when you want to do this, and you you start from the assumption that you have all the robotics of your dreams, you have to bring some reflection, and the ship has to be able to look out using vision, radar, sonar, and decide what it needs to do. And um, uh, there is a very easy way to understand the logic into the complexity of the decision is to it's to use a, a, a something that is um, called the Maslow pyramid. So if you've looked at psychology books, Maslow was a psychology professor and he classified the importance of needs for humans. So at the bottom you have to feed yourself and at the top you have to do like high level mission like you have to go to see a movie. It's the same for the ship. So you have low level demands that are local situation maintenance, maintenance, avoid collisions, you know, be always facing the waves. And then if you are okay with this, then you can go into higher level missions, objectives, which is, you know, know where you are and, you know, avoid, uh, uh, avoid to not follow the rules at sea, the international maritime organization rules. And then the top level needs that you have to fulfill in a ship like this is, you know, do your job, which is collect data. So go somewhere, collect data about the science you carry. So to do this, it's using a, a set of uh, AI uh, subset. And this is, again, all in the ship. So uh, from the left to the right. So on the left, I put some sensors. I mean, there are more sensors. There is sonar on the ship, for example. But this is just to give you a sample. So some sensors provide very structured data but sometimes very unreliable. So for example, the AIS is quite unreliable. So you will get it, you will not get it from the surrounding ships. 
uh, and then uh, you have some sensor that provide uh, unstructured data like the cameras so there are six cameras on the on the on the ship that cover 360 so two in the front two on the side and two on the back and so the first thing that's done in the ship is the um, to use uh, vision models that have been customized uh, to see I, I remind you the ship is moving it's a 15 meter ship that's supposed to go on seas that will be 15 meters wave so it's really moving and um, that have been trained um, you know they started collecting data for training the models in 2016 so it's uh, quite uh, a bunch of data collected at sea so you push this through a deep learning model you get structured data from the vision and then all the data is mapped into a virtual map so that's what we call data fusion and at that point you know what's around you so that's the first piece so this is a uh, you know using vision tools and then, um, so you, you've sensed what's around you. Then you go to make an assessment of what you should do. And uh, this is where uh, they use a, a tool that's coming from uh, the finance sector. So it's very interesting. In the finance world, you may not know it, but when you swipe your card and you pay, whatever network you're using, uh, like Visa or MasterCard or any other one, uh, your payment goes through um, a rule-based system that's called ODM. And there are about an average of 300,000 rules in the systems. And they immediately, in a like, couple of milliseconds, assess if this is a fraud or not. So it is uh, a set of rules that are written by fraud specialists, not programmers, that are running on a, like a model on, a, on a runtime. So they've, did, they've done the same thing using that tool for all the collision regulation at sea. So they apply uh, that engine to define what they should do versus other ships. So do you have to avoid the ship by the right, by the left? Do you have to give way? And so there are the formal rules. And there are also the, the rules that are you know normal captain rules, safety rules to avoid the accidents. And so this, uh, those rules were done and by captains, sea captains. So they have a next corvette captain. So a corvette is a nice, you know, warship, and he has described the rules to the system. And the beauty of using a tool like this is that the tool provides, like in the banking world, where you have a highly regulated business, you have to be able to explain every decision, like giving a loan or not. The tool is able to explain all the decision being taken. This is very, very, very important for, for the, the future because you know they are not going to allow standalone ship like this if they are not able to know exactly how a decision is being taken. So this is a, um, a key tool in the, in the solution. So once you've done that, you've done that assessment of every contact around you and you know what to do, you, you have not yet decided you know, what's your bearing and what's your speed. So at that point, they apply a, an optimization uh, uh, process to it. So if you want, before you have the one-to-one, -one, you know, Mayflower to any contact problem resolved, and then you need to resolve the total problem. So all the ships around you, the one too many, you have to include the weather, you have to include your battery level and uh, the ship parameters. And so this is done with uh, uh, a software that's called Cplex. And Cplex is very much used into the logistic sectors it's used to plan, optimize the routes for, you know, delivering pizza in New York, for example. So it's a very common um, software in uh, doing optimization. So when we say optimization, it's a, it's a nonlinear programming model that you describe and you use it to, to run this, you know, NP complex problem and find a solution. So that's why one day maybe we'll have a quantum computer, but not today. Uh, so after that optimization um, activity, I mean, you actually have found your best route. And then you just need to go control the ship and go into the, I would say, the regular robotics. And so doing this, you use the weather. So they use the weather channel weather uh, input. So this is coming from the cloud to the, um, the, um, the link uh, that we were describing, you know, the horizon link. And then everything about the programming is either done on-prem or on the cloud and can be updated. So, you know, whether the sensing, the, the vision models, the rule models, the optimization models, 
you know, just think that with the, um, the horizon model, we can actually update them. And this is a big value because you can actually change behaviors as you go. So uh, that was a pretty complex chart. <laughs> I hope you got it. So any questions? You see any questions, Naim? Yeah, I have. I had. I had a question. Actually, I think uh, Aaron had one too. Is the is the data from the uh, ship that's being generated is that available open source for others to look at? And yeah. So all the data with? that you see on the dashboard is actually freely available to anybody. This is the the primary, you know, I would say they decided that they will make the data available. Okay. Okay. So yes. And then, then the uh, data about the decision inside the brain of the Mayflower is done. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 The, but the raw so data it's is kept, it's kept in the ship because uh, it will allow to explain everything or to replay the navigation, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so you know uh, earlier on you'd mentioned that there was triple redundancy in the little AI server that sits there. Uh, what about in things like the sensors? So you know you said six cameras. What if the left camera goes out? Like, yeah, how is the, that redundancy built in? Yeah, the, the, this is this is part of the redundancy. You know, the two yeah. cameras have an overlap, so if you lose one, you should be okay. You know, okay. the joke that they are saying to us since a lot of time is that unfortunately they couldn't train uh, an octopus to stay on the ship and wipe up the lenses on the camera, <laughs> so they are a little bit afraid that you know one of those sea birds goes and hooks on the camera lens. <laughs> so that's why there are two cameras. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. That that makes yeah. sense. Uh, all right. So another question from Jeff, and then uh, okay. So Jeff Zika, he's asking, how are you integrating real time weather predictions and path planning based on them? So the the real time product uh, prediction. So it's coming from the weather company. It's received at uh, the control center. You remember the chart where I was showing you the control center here? Let me move back to... So the, the weather goes to the control center. They do process on it. So essentially what they do, they reduce the weather scope to the cell where the ship is going to, to be because you don't need to, to see everything. And that processed weather data goes back to the cloud and back to the ship. And the ship aggregate this with its local weather. You know, the ship has a two duplicated um, local weather stations, and that's that's how the weather it's integrated. So the the global weather is not going raw into the ship. Okay, it's okay. pre-processed, and actually, this is the way they work in the shipping industry. They typically do uh, statistics, um, in route management processing on shore at the headquarters. Okay. It's very, very, very traditional layout there. Okay. Yeah. And, they, and they, you know, they, they try to, to fit to what they knew in their business. I mean, they mm -hmm. know the sea business mm -hmm. and we are just um, good geeks. Okay. To be honest. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, well, that's, well, that's what we all are here too. Right. Uh, all right. So Usman has a question. Usman, go, go for it. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Hey Eric and uh, Salam Naim. It's a really good. I, I really enjoyed this talk. So what I'm really interested in is um, when you have a system like this, an AI system where it's really complex and it has all these different moving parts to it. What is the development process like? As someone, I myself, I'm working at a kind of a robotics company. Um, I'm finding that it's like there's a lot of difficult decisions to make in terms of, you know, you have inputs to some things, you have different types of models running, and uh, I'm just imagining that with something so big. Like in the development process, what order do you address things in, um, and just what does that look like in general? Uh, so for the the CDCI, they use the Azure workflow. Okay, and they actually have a, a, a workflow for the robotics, for developing the robotics software. Hmm. They have one for the C optimizer, one for the uh, the rule sets, and one for the vision. They have actually parallel workflows. What's key in this is actually specifically for the vision is they use uh, um, Maximo because Maximo brings the, the tools to actually manage your library of image. Uh, this, you, you have to understand that this is not easy image processing. You're on a moving target. You're mm -hmm. talking six cameras. 
And uh, one of the most difficult things they told me was to make sure you could um, not confuse the, you know, the top of the waves with something. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they, they have three uh, pipelines, or four pipelines, four mm -hmm. development pipelines. And they, um, you know, at the end, this is where it gets into the containers and then it's, you know, shipped to the ship. Yeah, cool. And I, I saw I have another thing real quick, if you don't mind, Hans. Um, so, yeah, I, I heard you mention kind of the reliability in the decision making. They have to know what rules were followed to make the decision. Um, so, have you, uh, this is a, a pretty traditional challenge with if you want to use, for example, deep learning for, you know, something safety critical, there's a lot of pushback against that because you don't know what a deep learning model is doing for the most part. So are all of the AI models in this sense, are, do you guys move away from deep learning or do you try to incorporate it in some no, way that's- less... No, no, uh, we, we don't use deep learning at the rule, uh, at the implication, at the stage where the core regs are implemented. They use it only for the vision. I see. Uh, because uh, uh, the, the beauty of that set of tools, you know, ODM, it's called ODM. If you want to look it up, look for ODM, IBM. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it brings you all the explanations. So you see, when you look at this after the fact, you actually have a data map out of the data fusion, where for yeah. each echo, you know if you have a, a vision, a radar, a sonar, you know, AIS, and you can have a certainty level that's much better than just doing like deep learning on vision. Yeah. So it's very close to a normal captain. And then each target gets an assessment, you know, is this uh, like, uh, I know exactly what this is or is there a doubt? So there is a process there and this is what comes into the, the rule based system. Mm -hmm. okay. And, uh, and uh, this is, uh, we have already shown that, they have shown that to the authorities. I mean, including the US Coast Guard. And yeah. they just said, this is exactly what they need. They would oh, not nice. accept a bunch of different learning models and by the way, Usman, you know, we have tools in IBM to actually introspect the models. So mm. and it's a friend of mine who developed them. So I know those tools, but you know, this is, this would be so complex to explain to authorities yeah. that you forget it. It will never get approved. Right. Makes sense. So, well, so this right. to add, to add, Eric, uh, one. So I think if we, if we compare this to, let's say the, the autonomous cars, right? for the, uh, th this is not as complex as autonomous cars are. Because if you see the ocean is huge, right? It's like 70% mm. and we don't have like every second like a car, a ship passing by or something like that. So it is little bit in depth relative to the, you know, if we are doing something robotics in real world, we're interacting with so many different things at the same time, right? Or if example is the uh, is an auton autonomous car over there, it is much more complex. And in that case, for example, like the question, you're also looking at the, the life cycle of AI, right? So if you, have, if you are building these models, right, and how is your development process is interacting with updating, and like mm -hmm. Alex said, the, uh, which we call in IBM trust AI, do we know exactly what this model is doing, what it was intended to do? Can, can somebody explain this model? So I think in, in, in this uh, autonomous vehicle industry, it's probably it's much more complicated but in this case, like I said, the rules engine over here, these are the main things to make decision. And then we have, of course, the optics over there to navigate the ship. Yeah, yeah. It's, the assessment is done every second. So it's, it's not a car. Now, uh, you know, I'd be very curious to actually go in deep into a car and what they do. And uh, because, you know, I have some doubts of what they're doing, but that's Eric being critical. Okay, so uh, one little bit about uh, optimization. I think it's, uh, it's something you need to understand. Um, if you're in a bay with a bunch of targets, like uh, I'm showing here, it's actually a very complex problem to resolve. So uh, it is correct that when you are at sea, there will be few targets and that should be rather easy to resolve on a mathematical point of view. As soon as you're entering a bay, the problem actually becomes much harder and you have to to develop very interesting optim models to cater with the fact that this is not like a, a simple problem and uh, that what I, I put on the on the drawing here is just like a couple of ships 
it can get very much more difficult. And this is part of the reason why, uh, you know, this is going to, to travel and do stuff because this is going to be improved over time. I think this is one of the places where there is room for improvement. It's the busy areas, uh, optim uh, resolution. Right. So, uh, Naim is gone, so I'm alone. I can say bad things about Naim now, right, Hans? So I think that if you have questions about the, the edge, the why they did this, I think uh, be, you're very welcome to, to ask them. Uh, one thing I, I want to tell you is that this has not happened in one day. This is a, I met them in 2016, and it took from 2016 to January this year to actually be at sea and test. And there were a lot of data capture, a lot of model making, and a lot of simulation. They actually created a, a very nice, you know, serious game, like a video game to play with the, the AI on the ship. And uh, so this was not, you know, one day in the making. And we went there uh, when they called us, and when they called me and they say, okay, we have a problem. We are looking at solutions. Every time we say, well, you could try this. We have this in IBM, maybe not from the same industry. And, um, I think it's interesting to think that uh, we've been able to be very to do very interesting lateral thinking, you know, because we are using banking software in an autonomous ship. You know, uh, uh, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. No, so now, what uh, I yes. Oh, is it here? oh, so there's a there's another question. Do you want to take a question, or you want to move forward? So the question is, can you say a little about multi-ship feature look like uh, yeah it's very simple you can from this place you can control I don't know how many ships we don't have a limit today uh, it's very probable that uh, some uh, um, scientific organizations we want to have fleets of ship like this uh, the typical requirement they have is to be able to cover a big space in the ocean with the ships being like on a grid, but the grid is huge. You're like you're talking hundreds of miles or more and collect data at the same time, because today we don't know how to do this. And uh, so you have to, to resolve the grid problem. What you do is on top of each ship optimization uh, solution, you build an above layer of optimization that you can locate in the mother ship or you can locate on the cloud. That's gonna that's gonna give recommendation to the ship as a fleet, and then every ship maintains security and its normal mission. So the the mission to the ships will be instead of being built by somebody saying, you know, I want you to cover that space, it's an optimization software that's gonna build the mission for each ship and distribute it, and then they run their own mission, and you coordinate this way. It's not so easy to explain. I, I hope I'm clear. But essentially, yeah, you build uh, a layer on top of the ship of team. Okay. Uh, it looks like he has a follow-on question. Will multiple ships work to like a wolf pack? Uh, uh, they it's a dark question, but the answer is you, you can have ship coordinates together, yes. If you establish a communication okay. with the ships, the ships right. can actually that, that interact. The last of those questions. Okay. So one thing I wanted to do, and that's oh. uh, you know we're okay. about. That was the last of the questions. You're going to carry yeah, on. It's to show you what's on the ship in terms of science, because remember the goal of that ship is actually to perform science. So I took two examples, but just to. So there are a bunch of people participating, including the Jupiter Foundation in California. But essentially, uh, the ship carries uh, eight experiments. Uh, there is a bunch of sensors on water quality. There is a, a, a pollution sampling um, system, so it will collect uh, water. There are chemistry uh, tools that analyze uh, components in the in the water. There are tools to there are experiments to actually measure the sea level or the energy in waves. So this is very important for future navigation. Uh, we're actually testing new chips from IBM on you know, putting all this AI into a single, like, uh, like your finger ship, instead of this box. Uh, there is a very 
very, very interesting experiment that's done with the Jupiter Foundation about whales. And that experiment has their hydrophones under the hull, and um, it listens to the whales, it will classify them. And uh, it's also capable of interacting. So this is like, a, you know, not that trip really, but this trip is a test to have the experiment on the whale counting interact with the navigation and be able to say to the navigation system, okay, could you go like 300 miles to the right? I want to record something special. So this is very interesting. Uh, and that, that's going to be in the, you know, in the V2 of the, of the, of the, of the, the trips probably like next year, but that, that means that the way it's built, you can actually have the science interact with the navigation. And that's really great because you can actually go to a point where you say to the ship, okay, stay away from the coast, go in the Mediterranean Sea and count me the whales. That's kind of cool. So um, I wanted to show you one experiment because uh, you know when we say by experiments, so very often you think about it's collecting uh, data or it's creating sample, and that's it. Actually, uh, we have one experiment in the ship. It's called the hypertaste. So you can find it on the internet. You, you Google uh, hypertaste and IBM, and you end up in IBM research. It's a very interesting sensor that is trained by AI. So you actually train it to recognize more complex molecules that would take you, you know, a couple of million equipment to, to find on a regular lab in multiple days. And it can do the evaluation in 20 seconds. So we've trained it to recognize specific molecules, uh, carbonates, uh, more carbonate composites um, uh, for the trip. And, uh, and that's, uh, this is interesting because, you know, this is not IT, uh, but this is IT because there is an AI training uh, on the sensor measurements. But think about it, uh, that sensor, they tested it in the, in the Zurich lab on orange juice. And they could recognize the age of the orange juice, the kind of container, you know, whether it's a box, metal, or glass, and you could recognize the brand of the orange juice. So it's really capable of, you know, measuring complex molecules. But again, it's different. It's you have to train it, and then uh, you run it. But this is really, I think, the future of uh, uh, measurements in, in ships like this because. You know, once you you want you know what you're looking for, you train it for, and this stuff can run forever. It's kind of very very nice. And uh, back to the the whales. So uh, this is actually using um, an IBM software uh, for you know doing a, um, waveform analysis, and it's based on image recognition also. But uh, it's able to actually classify whales count them, identify the kind and the quantity. So it's like a census on the on the waves. So they're going to uh, do the first test on the first trip. Uh, again, back to my earlier, earlier comments, we have very little data on the on the whales at sea. So we are very happy that the Jupiter Foundation gave us, uh, because this is done by IBM Research, so I, that's why it says give IBM Research data. So we have sample data, so the system can actually you know, be pre-trained, so and then it will self-classify uh, uh, during the the crossing, and then it will send us, um, you know, snippets of data. So not the the raw data, but the process data. So all the sensors on the ship that do AI on the sensors, like uh, the wave energy, the sea level, the uh, the the sounds, they will actually provide to the researchers during the trip. AI process results, so not the raw data that will be kept in the ship, kept in the ship, but the process data. So you see, there is a lot of AI in the science side, also. Hans, are you still there? I am still here. One. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So I, I'm kind of ready to answer any question you have. You know, I've been in that project long enough. I invite you to go, you know, play with the mas400.com site. It's really full of stuff. There are videos, there's a ton of things. If you want to know how to get the data, we'll get back to you and we'll get you the information. I tested it on my laptop yesterday. I could get the ship data. Wow. So it works nice. Awesome. Uh, Again, question. it will work when the ship connects. Okay, <laughs> remember, the ship is going at sea. It is not your daughter. It is the ocean. It's going to be like a rough time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first time too, right? Um, 
Well, th there is a small ship that already crossed the ocean with uh, wind power. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But it was like, you know, this like uh, two meters plastic made. This is uh, that size, that type of uh, structure and this capacity of science. Uh, this is, uh, this is, I think, the first one of, of this kind. Oh, okay. Excellent. Uh, so there's a question from Ed. Is the intention for all decisions to be made by the AI captain or are some decisions left to the control center or do you see situations where they need to intervene? So the ship design point is no man on loop. So the ship is self-sufficient, takes its own decision. Nevertheless, there is a legal requirement to be able to, uh, to um, you know, stop the ship in terms of, you know, keep it in one place. So the control center can send a mission change and say, you know, stay where you are. And the reason why uh, they think it's important, it's not really for, you know, stopping the ship somewhere. It really has no sense. They think that uh, uh, it's possible that, you know, the ship cannot really bring uh, support to a, a vessel in distress. But the Mayflower could be sent close to the distressed ship and could be very easy to find because it can relay VHF. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I mean, the Mayflower is a big piece of metal. You, mean, you can find it on the sea. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, it's not carrying you know, safety equipment. It is not going to be able to host anybody, but it could, in case of you know, big emergency, be sent to a location and, and maintain position. OK. Cool. Uh... All right, I think that that was the question in the chat window. So, of, of, of you know the the some I had a question as well. So the the experiments that you showed the, the eight eight or whatever experiments, um, you said one of them will be in round two. Like out of all those, how many are going to be live on this first first round? No, this is all live. Oh, it is all. What's going to happen okay. in round two is the interaction. Okay, it's the interaction between the navigation and the experiment that is ready, but they're not going to to play okay, with okay. it this time. Okay. 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 No, this is all on board. Actually, we have the details. If you, this is worth the session, yeah. okay? Because it's a, you have a, you know, you see, it's interesting. You have this big edge, yeah, and you have the master edge, which is the navigation system, yeah, and then you have the science edge, and they actually created a, a local single centralized IT for all the science. Oh wow! Okay, interesting. So yeah. you have yeah. in the edge a science edge, and they they are they are separate. Uh, the navigation system can actually shut down power to the science mm -hmm. if it needs. Mm -hmm. It's still the I mean, it's the master on board. Okay. But um, it's uh, you have a bunch of science uh, IT on board. Wow. Okay. Very cool. That is that is awesome. It's big, it's, it's a big uh, place for the science. Yeah. You know, you can put a lot of people in yeah. there. I mean, they would be like slave in these all boats we we use in the past. But uh, it's it's a big space. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That that's that that makes sense. Much more. Uh, it is modular, and and each each it sounds like has its own ID. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, one of the things, a question uh, I got many times is, you know, how, how unique is the ship? Mm, okay. So all the buses, the controls are standard, top of the top grade, industrial system for the navy. Mm -hmm. So that's why they can actually port the solution to another ship. Okay. Because you just take it, plug it on the standard bus, assuming there are cameras behind, you do the, the setup, and here you go. Okay. So And it will have to be tuned to the ships, because camera will be in different mm -hmm. places, ship size will be different, the dynamics is different. So again, don't, don't be uh, simplifying, oversimplifying yeah, the system. Yeah, yeah. You, you will have, it, will have, it will have to be tuned to different shape right. of vessels. Right. Okay. No, that yep, that makes sense. Uh, so, in terms of um, so the components are all, all like all of the components are standard off the shelf. Like, is there anything on the boat that is custom? The um, all the robotics are standard yeah. robotics. Okay. okay. All the IT is standard IT. Excellent. All the software is this is the red hat you have in your laptop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Talking, I'm not talking CentOS, I'm talking yeah. true Red Hat, okay? Yeah. So this is all industry grade. All the software solution that they use from IBM is off the shelf, been sold for years. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. The science piece, you know, the scientific experiments, mm -hmm. they are 
each one of them is unique. Okay. 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 Customized for the research. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That makes sense. I mean, you know, the stand, I, I'm assuming because it's all standard, uh, a lot of it is standard off the shelf. It's one of the reasons why the cost is, uh, would you say, a tenth or a, a, a doing a, a, a normal ship, I guess. Um, but uh, okay, that makes sense. So, uh, all right, folks, if you have any questions, um, oh, here we go. There's, and Usman has another one here. In terms of edge autonomous systems, how transferable do you think your general AI approach or software architecture is to other use cases? Or do you feel it's something that only applies to autonomous? Yeah, good question. It's a good question, and you're going to be surprised. We have already transferred the structure to IBM manufacturing. Oh. So you know the horizon structure with the mm -hmm. the central place and the edge? Mm -hmm. So we have applied it to, you know, at the end of the line, when you we, we do manufacture yeah. for 10% of revenue mm -hmm. systems, you know, hardware like computers, mm -hmm. OK? E-computers, power computer, and storage. Mm -hmm. At the end of the line, there is a checkup, you know, connectors, stickers, paint scratches, I mean, quality checkup. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we, um, you know, being in that division, I know those people, and they mm -hmm. were trained to do AI. It was very complex to do. They, they were kind of, you know, training models, carrying them by, mm -hmm. you know, email. It was like very complex. And actually, what they did is implemented the Horizon mm -hmm. solution. So, you know, in in, in the IBM uh, commercial language, is called. Uh, it's it's in the cloud packs, so it's a, a, con a container solution. It's called the IEAM, but that's the Docker version of the the Edge, the exactly the 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 Horizon one. And they mm -hmm. what they do is they deploy models trained in a in a if you want the the model plant mm -hmm. for checking the, the the machines, and the operator is told if the machine is compliant or not. And they have, a, they have implemented something that will be in the Mayflower very soon, but not on the first three because, you know, it's still the first one. Mm -hmm. They have an interface to the operator that can say, no, you and I are wrong. This is good. And the operator can actually locally retrain. Okay. Okay. And cool. you have to know that when we speak to sea captains, mm -hmm. big ship captains, and we tell them, well, we're going to bring you some autonomy and some recommendation. They say, well, can I, can I say to that you know, machine that that's the way I'm driving. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, already planned to have this function. So the if you want on uh, very simply, a captain will be able to say, you know, no, 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 you know, don't yeah. do that. So they can override it. So you there will be a possibility to do reinforcement training okay. at the edge. Okay. Oh, cool. All right. So we do it. Oh. Okay. Uh, Milan, how's it going? Go for it. Hi. Pretty good. Um, I have uh, all these questions, but the presentation was so well put together, most of them got answered. Plus, uh, Hans has the same kind of train of thought as me, so he asked most of them. But as you're talking about all these scientific experiments, I kept thinking, well, why can't this be put on something like the Ocean Cleanup Project? And then you you answer that by saying, well, what if we need to tell them to go to a specific spot? And that, that makes sense if you have a specific goal in mind. But since it's off the shelf solution, how how easy is to actually put it like on the ocean, clean up a vessel that just kind of floats and collects garbage, but uh, maybe get more data on what's going on. You, there's some microplastics yeah. that I see they're gonna be um, how easy is to implement it since it's mainly off the shelf and you don't really need to build the vessel if you already have something floating, collecting garbage? I think it's, I mean, I don't know the, the ship you're referring to, so it's, uh, but I think it's quite easy, you know, bring some dollars, we'll do it. No, not we. I mean, the company doing the ship will be very happy to do it. You know, the, for them, it's a, it's a non-profit ship for research, but if they need to build them, you know, they will make... I mean, this is going to be their job to pr produce those systems and those ships, and probably to operate them. So I don't think it's a, it's yes. it's, it's a it's a difficulty. Okay. Uh, so once once you prove that all this off the shelf technology works and autonomous uh, travel, then it will be just 
easy to implement on something that's already built. Yeah, it will have to, remember you it will have to be customized to the ship's dynamics. So the robotics yeah, under course. it will be adapted, okay? And uh, and the rule sets may change because you know if you're on a aircraft carrier, I mean, you know, you, you don't give way to a small ship. Okay, you just move. So uh, the, yeah. I, I guess uh, you have to understand that the rule sets uh, probably and uh, the ship dynamics will have to be uh, correctly adapted. But I don't see why it couldn't be done. I mean, it's no big deal. All right, cool. Thank you. All right. It's the uh, same way some people are telling us that uh, they want to replace uh, the scientific equipment by some uh, elaborate payloads. Yeah. I, I mean, so you know, we were talking about this earlier about brownfield, greenfield. That that's a good question in terms of you know, there's a lot of ships out there already, and, uh, and yeah, retrofitting and, and those. But you know, no, they are not looking to retrofit uh, really brownfield ships. What they are looking for is, can you give me a digital assistant on the deck that's going to be watching all the time, that can prevent accidents by giving recommendations. And the insurers are saying yes. And so okay. that digital assistant is going to have the, all those rules, explain all the stuff, so I can I can check what happened. Because you know they don't have a lot today. They have they have the AIS track, yeah. Okay, yeah. and they have the log yeah. of the captain. Now yeah. you can have a system in that case that's going to be much more smarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, it's a, it's a safety device for for the for yeah. the the people that have existing ships. Okay. Yeah. That, so, yeah, I, I can see that. that. That's a good MVP to get going with, right? Like, uh, I guess a commercial type of MVP for retrofitting. That's cool. Um, okay. I think that was it for the questions. So, movie? This is movie cool. time? Yeah. Let's, let's show your movie. Okay. So, I'm going to show the, the three minute one. It's very nice. So, give me a second. Do you see a black screen? Our oceans test the limits of our ingenuity, endurance. No, not yet. There's no screen. They also sustain us. Do you don't see it? Okay, I'll, give me a second. Oh, okay, it's coming up. Oh, it went again. So I'm going to try it again, and uh, hopefully it will go. Our oceans oh, test the limits oh, of it is not sharing. And scale. Ah, it's not sharing? No, you can hear the sound, but it's not sharing. Okay, so this is me. So, so hold, on, hold on. Okay, so hold Do you see something now? Our oceans test the limits of our ingenuity, endurance, and skill. They also sustain us. Now, we must learn how to protect this precious resource by exploring its expanse like never before. What began with sails and star charts is now solar powered and data driven, powered by IBM Hybrid Cloud, edge computing technology, and AI. The Mayflower Autonomous Ship is an unmanned marine research vessel designed and developed through a partnership between ocean research nonprofit Promare and IBM. Using renewable solar energy, it can traverse the oceans, capturing valuable data while navigating challenging environments, vast distances, and extended durations without the need for a human crew. More than a simple experiment, it's a pioneering attempt to help us understand how to sustain the viability of our planet. During its voyage, the Mayflower will be piloted by an AI captain running on edge computing technology that syncs up with the IBM cloud. The AI captain can safely identify and avoid other vessels and ocean hazards using a blend of data and automated decision-making. It uses IBM Maximo with Power9 Systems visual inspection technology to analyze and interpret images flowing in from the ship's multiple onboard video cameras and sensors, as well as meteorological models from the weather company. Training of the AI captain's machine learning models was done on shore with IBM Power Systems and IBM Maximo Visual Inspection using over a million maritime images. 
Now MAS can recognize a variety of ocean hazards, from other vessels to buoys, to breakwaters, pieces of land, and floating debris. Following international maritime regulations for safety, the IBM Operational Decision Manager implements maritime rules, while IBM CPLEX Optimizer determines the optimal route, analyzing all available data to plot a safe course. The AI captain weighs possibilities and makes decisions to pilot the ship while assimilating outcomes to continually learn and guide future decisions, all of which are analyzed by a safety manager function running on IBM Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Decisions are made locally, drawing on compute power from the ship's edge computing system. IBM Edge Application Manager is used to deploy software onto the ship and out to the sensor devices. When in range, the ship connects to IBM Cloud to report findings, placing them in cloud object storage, gathering additional data, and updating data models accordingly. As it skims the waves, the ship will examine the ways climate change affects Earth's oceans, gather insights that could help transform the shipping and marine research industries, and reveal the impact human behavior has on marine life. From coral reefs to orca pods, the Insights Unlocked gives us a glimpse into the state of ocean health, helping us diagnose and design solutions for the threats facing our seas. And for the transoceanic shipping industry, this data reveals how renewable energy and autonomous vessels can sustainably reduce the cost and human risk associated with long voyages, vast distances, and challenging conditions. Powered by IBM Hybrid Cloud, Edge Computing Technology, and AI, the Mayflower can do more than just gather data. With it, it can travel farther, reveal more about our future than ever before, and explore the challenges facing Earth's most important frontier. Good quality or bad quality? That's very good. That was really excellent. So that uh, actually you brought up good. another question for me. So, you know, there's obviously... Go ahead. Um, so I, I was going to ask another question just kind of related. So, you know, there's obviously a, a bunch of IBM products in there. But what about open source? Is, uh, is Red Hat and... Uh, obviously, it's a Red Hat enterprise. But is Red Hat and Open Horizon the only... Uh, uh, I guess, open source uh, tools being used, or are there more? Uh, well, I don't know everything in the robotics, you know, yeah. I focus on the yeah. cognitive piece. <laughs> uh, but um, now what's interesting is when I met them, everything they were doing was Windows. And uh, when we look oh, at the okay. cognitive piece, they realized they had to, they had to move to win to, from Windows to Linux. And uh, yeah. and so I think that was the big change they they faced in you know I met them in 2016, like uh, early it was mid 2016, and we had a meeting early 2017. I told them you know if you really want to do it this way you know this is going to be in containers because that's coming to you babies, and so they moved everything to to Linux, and uh, uh, you know I think they were very mm -hmm. happy. Uh, by the fact they could use okay. so many solutions. I mean, the vision is open source, it's Tensor. Even if they use an IBM package mm -hmm. around it, okay. it's Tensor. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, 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 the software for the edge, inside the box, you have Horizon. So a lot of things in there are actually commercial versions of open source products. Okay. Okay. Oh, cool. Very good. Uh, it looks like that's it. Aaron had a comment. Uh, not a question. So yeah, using using the yeah, it's more just, yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say yeah, using the data from you can just see a whole bunch of hacker uh, for high school students, university students, uh, for professional developers, just to grab this yeah. and see what else you could do with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, just to you know, plug Open Horizon one more time. I mean, that allows you to actually run updates uh, without bricking. You, know, you can't really brick this thing, so um, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of would be really bad. Um, but you know, with Open Horizon, it allows you would be able to push updates, uh, push new code, uh, things like that. So you can um, do it without um, taking it out of the water or 
you know, doing updates like that. And once again, I mean, like in the commercial shipping world, these boats have um, such fast turnaround and it, it's we, we I've talked to one guy uh, from one of the large shipping companies and they actually have an insane amount of power there uh, because they have a little bit of room and they actually put in racks but the thing is is they're like we have almost no connectivity so everything has to be um so this type of solution and the ai and, and other stuff that's in there is uh they want it <laughs> <laughs> and and there's many other places around the world where there's just such low connectivity um you know as i told you guys before uh, you know i come from the iot world and it's utterly amazing to me of how much stuff that when you show uh somebody a solution in the healthcare thing about how to use iot somebody from someone else goes oh if you change this this and this i could use it in my smart agriculture or things like that it, it's just it's so new mm -hmm. even though you know we've maybe known about it for seven eight years or ten years it's just so new and these type of things that just really kind of you know get you excited and then get you thinking about oh what if i change this mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. anyways yeah. as you can tell i i, I totally love the product <laughs> <laughs> the project yeah. Yeah. so if you're in boston cool like two project. three weeks you can see it see her sorry Yep. Soon, soon close to you. And, uh, so, it's, uh, so it's it's a uh, so if it takes yeah. off, they expect it to take two to three weeks. So assuming weather is all good and it takes off next week, it takes it's expected uh, to take two to three weeks to cross the ocean. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, so is that I, is I that what you're expecting? Okay. They're expecting it to take two to three weeks to cross the ocean. Yeah. Correct. No. I don't know what's going on? Hang on. Uh, yeah. He said yes. Um, All right. Very cool. To, to uh, to take we're at the, actually also. Yes. Yeah. No. I. I yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, it looks uh, we're we're actually. Uh, Pretty much out of time anyway. One, it's almost one one thirty here, um, and uh, it's it's late for Eric. Eric, I don't know if you're going to hang around for the uh, for afterwards. We have a handful yeah. of folks. Um, I, I'll hang around for a little bit, um, but uh, otherwise, thank you so much. And uh, uh, you know, thank Naeem. I'll send him a note as well. Uh, now it makes sense uh, how it's tied in to you know what he's working on to the, the uh, to Mayflower. Uh, <laughs> But uh, this was really good and, uh, you know, welcome back, especially, you know, once you guys start learning more, it'd be great to have you guys back to see what you've learned and, uh, and what kind of the roadmap looks like beyond that. And uh, um, otherwise, this is an awesome effort and um, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for the awesome presentation uh, and uh, uh, to the attendees. Thanks again. Uh, if you have any questions, if you want to hang around, um, as soon as I end this uh, session, it will take you back into the lounge. Uh, I will be at the IoT Hub table for probably another 15 minutes or so, then I have to go.